Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Tivoli Bay Talks. My name is Jim Harrington, and these talks are held quarterly on the first Thursday of the month. Uh, the talks are sponsored by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, the Hudson River Research Reserve, and the Village of Tivoli. Join us on December 5th when Tom Lake will be here about the prehistory of the Hudson Valley. He's going to talk about what it was like before the Europeans showed up. And tonight, Eric Kivia will give us a talk on biodiversity of the Hudson Valley. Thank you. Eric? Welcome. I want to give you a sampling of the uh, plants and animals and their habitats that occur up and down the Hudson River, focusing especially on the tidal wetlands and the shorelines. Um, in the estuarine part of the river between New York City and Detroit Dam. Let's see if I can take this over here. Okay. So one of the kinds of habitats or environments in the Hudson is a rocky shore such as you see at Magdalen Island and these are what we call tidal shallows. These are areas that are less than about six feet deep at low tide. So that means that they're shallow enough to support rooted aquatic vegetation, although not all the areas actually have vegetation. It is capable of growing there. In between here, in between Magdalen Island and the railroad at Tivoli North Bay. And a lot of what I'm going to show you is from Tivoli Bays because this is the area that I've studied for 40 years. But I'll also range down the river into some of the brackish wetlands and maybe some other areas like the uh, New Jersey Meadowlands, which are connected to the Hudson. And they're a good example of or an extreme example of what happens when these kinds of estuarine wetland environments get overdeveloped for uh, industry and transportation uses. This is Tivoli North Bay from the east shore. This is actually where the uh, trail comes out overlooking the south end of the bay. This is the north end of Kruger Island and the railroad here with one of the uh, trestles or bridges. This is the main river in uh, Glasgow on the other side, and of course the Catskills. And a lot of what you can see here um, is cattail. These are the higher areas of the marsh in the upper intertidal zone. Can everyone hear me if I speak like this? Okay. You're welcome to move up or uh, closer if you like. Now, I just want to show you a few diagrams to explain how the uh, geography of the estuary affects the kinds of animals and plants that are present and how the uh, estuary is structured in terms of the seawater coming in and out and also what the topography of the marsh, the high and low spots in the marsh, have to do with the kinds of plants and animals that live there. This is the large scale. This is very diagrammatic. So here's the Hudson River estuary. It's a long, narrow, relatively straight estuary compared to uh, other estuaries on the east coast, at least south of here. And uh, for the sake of explanation. This is north, this is south. The Hudson Highlands are the uh, hills of the older Appalachians that cut across, or I should say the estuary that cuts through the hills of the, of the Appalachians at the Hudson Highlands just uh, between Peekskill and Beacon and Newburgh here. So diagrammatically these are the uh, high rocky hills that extend in a northeast-southwest direction on both sides of the estuary. And this is the estuary itself. Now the estuary is a corridor for movement of animals and plants. 
uh, might sound strange to hear me say plants move. Well, they, they do. They move from one generation to the next because they have seeds or fragments that uh, allow them to start growing in a, in a new place in the next generation. And some plants uh, actually are not attached and they, they move with the currents or in other ways. And uh, the duckweeds are little plants that are constantly moving with the water currents. Uh, so, so plants and animals are able to move up and down the estuary, uh, the water, the wetlands, and the shorelines. There is a very substantial movement of migratory birds in the spring and the fall uh, along the shorelines and wetlands of the Hudson. And migratory fishes and occasional marine mammals in the estuary itself. Uh, very large numbers of fish come into the estuary to spawn and grow up, or in the case of the American eel, actually come in here when they're very small and, and grow up in the estuary or its tributaries and then go back down into the uh, Atlantic in, in the Sargasso Sea area to spawn. And uh, there are also animals that disperse up and down. So migration is a two-way movement. Birds go up in the spring back in the fall, for example. Um, dispersal is a one-way movement of animals or, or plants. And it, it uh, allows organisms to occupy habitat where there's space, uh, to uh, have gene flow from one population to another, and because that's important for maintaining the genetic diversity and viability of populations of, of the species, and to, um, and to occupy entirely new territory. So as an example, so let me just say something else first. So this is a corridor for movement, and secondarily the Hudson Highlands is also a corridor for movement of, of animals and plants. But these are also barriers, so there are some uh, organisms that don't readily cross a wide body of water. Some animals can't swim at all. Fl uh, Southern flying squirrel is one of those. Uh, some animals just don't swim very well. The, uh, Virginia possum is an animal that's, you know, not, not very, um, you know, it's not adapted to really go into the water, so it's not a good swimmer. In about 1920, the uh, naturalist biologist Ernest Thompson Seaton reported the first possum on the east side of the Hudson. So up until then, possums had been moving, ex ex uh, gradually extending their geographic range northward and northeastward. And there was a barrier here. And eventually, enough individuals were able to cross to establish a population on the east side of the Hudson. As you go from, you can look at that. As you go from uh, east to west or northeast to southwest, uh, through the Hudson Valley and on farther, there are in many groups of animals and plants fewer species. And this is especially true of the salamanders and, uh, and uh, some of the fishes, the minnows, which is a large group of, of mostly small fishes. There's less diversity. And some of that, one of the reasons for that is that the Hudson is a barrier for movement from west to east for some of these species that evolve farther west of here. All right, so here's a different process, and it has to do with the exchange of materials and organisms between the Hudson River estuary and the ocean. Now, I'm going to assume that you, you're familiar with the word estuary. It refers to a place where the uh, waters of the ocean and fresh waters of a river or another freshwater body mingle. So 
it's, um, for example, uh, a river that's penetrated by the tides, like the Hudson River, which is tidal all the way up to the dam at Troy. Uh, so, if you think of this diagram as having a north end here and a south end here, this is the uh, area up here that contributes fresh water to the estuary, and, and this is the ocean down here. There's a salinity gradient in the Hudson where uh, everything north, certainly north of here, and probably north of about Poughkeepsie, is really fresh water all the time, or almost all the time. So that means that the amount of salt, sodium chloride and, and other salts, mostly sodium chloride, in the water is uh, less than 100 parts per million by weight. So that's a very small, that, that's probably just barely enough salt for you to be able to taste just a tiny bit of salt in the water, uh, just to give you a point of reference. So up here where we are, and on farther north, it's always fresh, it, as far back as water quality records go, which is about 100 years or a little more. When you go farther down the estuary, you start to encounter the uh, areas where salty water from the ocean mixed with fresh water from the watershed. And consequently, there's a, a gradient or a, uh, an increasing level of saltiness, of salinity, from just south of us on down and out into the ocean. Um, it's in the spring when there's a lot of freshwater runoff because snow and ice are melting up in the Adirondacks and in other places, and, and also because there's some water that's released from reservoirs in the Adirondacks to, to keep the Hudson from becoming too salty because Poughkeepsie and Kingston use it for water supply. Um, it's actually Poughkeepsie and uh, it's not Kingston, it's one of the suburbs of Kingston. Um, so in the spring it can be fresh all the way down to the George Washington Bridge because there's a lot of, of freshwater discharge going out of the estuary and pushing the salt water back out. But gradually through the, the spring and the summer and into this time of the year, the early fall, as it gets drier, in a typical year, it's not always dry at this time of the year. <clears throat> the the uh, salty water from the ocean comes in a little farther and mixes with fresh water and becomes progressively diluted. So you have a movement of salt of salt water more and more diluted going up the estuary until it is so diluted that the signal of salt from the ocean is no longer detectable. So then it's less than one and 100 parts per million salinity or tenth of a part per thousand salinity. Salinity is measured in parts per thousand or parts per million. And to give you a point of reference, let's we'll say two points of reference, the ocean is 35 parts per thousand salinity. So you know how salty that is because you've all tasted ocean water. Uh, the uh, fresh water normally, certainly in this part of the world where there's a lot of rainfall, is uh, less than 0.1 parts per thousand. So compare 0.1 to 35 parts per thousand. And in fact, it's usually down under uh, 0.05 or 0.025 parts per thousand. So it's re there's really not very much salt in fresh water, but there always is some salt. And the proportion of different kinds of salt, sodium chloride versus potassium chloride and other things that are there, it uh, distinguishes seawater from fresh water as well as the amount of salt. So there's a salinity gradient. So things that live or 
forage or do something else down in this part of the river have to be able to tolerate more salt than the organisms that use the upper part of the estuary. Now, here's something a little bit different. You know where the watershed is, according to American terminology. This is the uh, area of land in surface water that contributes fresh water to a body of water. It could be the Hudson, it could be a lake, it could be a pond or a small stream. So that's what we call the watershed. The watershed of the Hudson River estuary is, sorry, is about, um, if I remember correctly, about 1,400 square miles. Goes up into the southern Adirondacks, goes into a little tiny bit of eastern Massachusetts and eastern Connecticut and a little tiny bit of north, northern New Jersey, but it's mostly in New York State, eastern New York. And it's roughly what we call the Hudson Valley and some other areas farther north. So that's where the freshwater discharge comes into the estuary. But then there's this area that contributes uh, seawater and all of the substances and organisms that live in seawater to the lower end of the estuary. And I call that the sea shed. And we can't say how big that is because things move around a lot in the ocean and in the area between what's nominally the Hudson down to, to the, it's not shown on here, but you'll see it in a few slides on the map. The southern tip of Manhattan Island, the Battery as it's called, is nominally the southern end of the Hudson River. So that's mile point zero. That's where we just agree arbitrarily the Hudson River starts. But there's more estuary below that. There's New York Harbor, there's Lower New York Bay, and there's all the things that are connected to that, all the other estuarine bodies of water, the East River, Long Island Sound, um, Raritan Bay, Newark Bay, the Hackensack River, and some other things. Those are all uh, places where there's a mixture of freshwater and seawater, and they're all connected to the Hudson. So in a sense, they're part of this area that uh, may contribute stuff that gets carried up into the Hudson River estuary. And there are physical processes that have to do with the mixing of freshwater and saltwater and the movement of the tides that actually do carry chemicals, natural and artificial chemicals, and plants and animals and other organisms up into the Hudson River estuary from the sea shed. And some of the things that go up through that mechanism are pollutants. So we, you know, if you're in the lower part of the estuary, like down near New York City, you might encounter some of the um, PCBs or dioxins or metals that come from places like uh, the Hackensack Meadowlands in Newark Bay. Now we're moving into the tidal wetlands, which is what I'm going to focus on for most of the rest of this time. And pretty soon I'm going to show you a map and then examples of different kinds of animals and plants and, and their habitats. Uh, but just to give you one more kind of perspective on what goes on in these tidal wetlands, there's um, another kind of gradient, which is an elevation gradient. It, it is shown diagrammatically on this top of this triangle. Uh, so this is average high tide level, mean high water it's often called, and average low tide level, which is mean low water. So uh, half of the high tides are a little higher than this, and half of them are a little lower than this, and the same with the low tides. And here at Tivoli Bays, the distance between mean, mean high water and mean low water vertically is four feet. Okay, so that's, that's about like this. Uh, and that's, remember, that's average and average. Uh, the high tides can be very much higher than this, even to the point of a storm surge from Hurricane Sandy, which was about six feet higher than mean high water in the Tivoli North Bay. Uh, and they can be very much lower than mean low water when there's a full moon and a low tide and the winds 
blowing from north to south, everything kind of gangs up and pushes the water or pulls the water back out towards the ocean. So in this gradient, and this is not smooth in the marshes because there are, are tidal creeks and lumps of mud and areas of higher elevation that build up between the tidal creeks over tens or hundreds or even longer of years. Um, there are different divisions, so these are not sharp and you can't see the boundaries very well, but there are different um, zones or belts of elevation in a tidal wetland. And they go from subtidal areas that are uh, covered by water all the time or almost all the time. Up through the lower intertidal zone, the middle intertidal zone, the upper intertidal zone, the upper edge of the intertidal zone, and I call that plus IT, and the supratidal or above the tides, above most tides areas that um, extend from about mean high water to probably about the extent of the Hurricane Sandy storm surge, so three to six feet above mean high water. And so that supratidal area is actually influenced by the higher than average high tides and by storm surges. Uh, so as you go up this elevation gradient, the areas are covered by water for progressively shorter periods during each 25 hour, during each 12 and a half hour time cycle. Um, and what's interesting to me as an ecologist is that as you go up that gradient and there's shorter and shorter periods of flooding, the uh, vegetation gets taller in general, not, not all the plants, but in general the, the uh, plants that are present are taller. The biomass, that is the amount of dry plant matter per unit area, per, we, do, we usually think of a square meter, but it could be a square foot or something or an acre. Um, the biomass is larger. The species richness, the number of species in a square meter is greater. The amount of litter, which is the dead plant material, it doesn't sound very interesting, but it actually is extremely important in the marsh. There's more litter, and there's more soil organic matter, SOM, because the more the bigger the plants are, the more biomass, the more litter, the more soil organic matter is formed uh, as the uh, soils gradually build up over long periods. All right, here's the map just to orient you to a few of the places that I'm going to talk about. Here's the battery at the southern tip of Manhattan. So that's the south end of the Hudson River. I don't know how you, you know, it's just an arbitrary point. This is connected to it here, this is connected to it, Long Island Sound is connected to the East River and the Harlem River. All of these things are connected. But, but this is what we call the Hudson River. And it goes up past New York City here. This is uh, the Bronx here. Uh, Yonkers, Nyack, which is near Piermont Marsh, just south of the Tappan Zee Bridge. Actually, it's right here, uh, near the New Jersey State Line. The uh, Croton Point and Croton River marshes, I'll mention. Uh, Constitution Island Marsh, or Constitution Marsh between Cold Spring and Garrison here on the east shore, Beacon and Newburgh, Poughkeepsie, and then starting down here at the match line of the two pieces of the map, um, Hyde Park, Nori Point, and the nice little marsh uh, where Jim works at the mouth of the Indian Kill, and uh, Kingston Point Marsh, Tivoli Bays, right here. Um, Ranshorn at Catskill, Ranshorn Wetland, Middle Ground Island between Hudson and Athens, Stockport, and some other, actually lots of other 
well, is in a very shallow, narrow part of the Hudson between Stockport and, uh, and Troy, which is as far as the tides go. So now we're going to look at the, um, let's call them the ecological communities, which is the groups of plant and animal species that occupy these zones as you go from the subtidal areas that are flooded almost all the time up through the intertidal zone to the supratidal areas that are very infrequently flooded. This is water chestnut. Uh, this plant, or rosette, actually is part of a plant. Sometimes a plant has a dozen of these. Uh, attached to each other. This rosette of leaves is about a foot across, so it's bigger than life on the screen. These are individual leaves, they're about this big. There are uh, spongy floats in the stems of the leaves, and there's a long, maybe six feet or more long stem with um, Different botanists call them different things, but they're submerged leaves and water roots that uh, can absorb nutrients from the water. And then that stem is anchored in the mud by the by this, except the ones that aren't painted. <laughs> uh, that's this serves two functions. These horns or spines on the uh, shell of the fruit. This is a big single seeded fruit, the water chestnut. Uh, one is that they anchor the plant in the mud. It doesn't wash away, although it can still survive if it does break loose. And the other is that they, they when they're alive, they have, or when they're just mature, they have barbs on the tips, and they, the barbs have worn off. On this nut. Uh, and that allows the nut to stick to the feathers of a goose or maybe the bottom of your boat or your fishing net and to get carried from one body of water to another. So now this plant, after being in the Hudson since before the 1930s, we don't know exactly how long, probably 50 years earlier than that, is very extensive in the freshwater tidal Hudson, and it's now spreading into lots of ponds and lakes inland away from the Hudson. And uh, <laughs> I get a kick out of this. So this is an interesting piece of artwork. Uh, but even the nuts, just the plain nuts that haven't been painted, are sold in New York City for a dollar each. <laughs> so you, you want to make a little extra money, maybe you can do that. As we move up the intertidal zone into the, into the lower intertidal zone where the sediment, the soil, is flooded for about two-thirds of the time, this is the dominant plant here. This is called spatterdock. And this is a big, this is more, actually that's not spatterdock, this is spatterdock here, this is picture of me. Spatterdock is a big yellow water lily. And instead of having floating leaves like it would in a pond, it has erect leaves which seem to be an adaptation to the tidal fluctuation. You don't usually see them look like this in a non-tidal body of water. So there's a lot of this. And one of the things that happens is it gets, a lot of it gets eaten by these little tips of an inch long water on the leaf beetles. Um, and then birds and other animals eat the water on the leaf beetles. So there's an important food chain uh, that starts with the spatter dock and also the water chestnut, because this insect eats water chestnut as well. It goes through the beetles to a number of different kinds of animals that eat insects. 
including birds, for example, like cedar wax wings and probably red winged blackbirds. Uh, this is a plant that doesn't uh, stay in one part of the intertidal zone. It can be found from the lower intertidal zone to the upper intertidal zone, and even rarely in non-tidal flatlands in New York. It's very rare in New York, northern New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and southern New England. But when you go uh, to southern New Jersey and south, it becomes rather common in, in certain kinds of water bodies and wetlands. Uh, Golden Club, it can be a foot high or two feet high. It has many of these very striking yellow and white flower stalks, which give it the name Golden Club. And uh, it was first reported very widely in the Hudson in the 1930s. It's been declining ever since. I did a survey in 1975 or 76, and another one last year and this year. It is a, a lot less golden club now than it was 35, 40 years ago. Why? I'm not sure. I do know that in recent years it's being eaten by large grazing animals, and I'm not sure what these are. They could be deer, beaver, Canada geese for all those and, and other animals as well. And we've been setting camera traps trying to find out what's eating uh, golden club because that may be one of the factors that's causing it to be harm. This is a common species of lady beetle that uh, actually eats pollen as well as insects. And that's probably what it's we? These are the flowers of the golden plum. Here's a flower, here's another flower. And the, this beetle is probably collecting and eating pollen on the, uh, the flower cluster of the golden plum. Whether it's carrying pollen from one spike to another, I don't know. No, I don't think anyone knows what pollen no, is. Sir, it's in a okay, thank you. So I'm going to move a little faster now. Uh, so in the middle of your title zone, there's a number of different kinds of plants. Spike rush is one of them. Soft stem pearl rush is another one. Uh, there are probably 15 species that are common along the banks of the tidal creeks and in other parts of the middle intertidal zone. And then when we go into the upper intertidal zone, typically much of the marsh in that zone is uh, dominated by cattail either narrow leaf cattail or a, <coughs> a hybrid of narrow leaf and broad leaf cattail. Or Phragmites. This is called Phragmites or common reed. Uh, reed is kind of an ambiguous name, so biologists usually just refer to it as Phragmites. So these are the <coughs> most common or most dominant species in the upper intertidal zone, which is flooded about a third of the time. And here's an oblique, so from an angle like this, oblique aerial view, 1984, of part of North Bay. Most of this is, is cattail. Here's one of the major tidal creeks. Here's this Apache of Fred Lines. Uh, and this is Fabric Hall, where the elevation is a little lower. And here's a close up of Fred Lines. This is not in the Hudson, but that's what the plant looks like. Uh, there we can also see some willow trees uh, on these little um, natural levees where the sediments deposit and build the soil up a little <coughs> higher along the banks of some of the major tidal creeks. Another plant of the upper inter tidal zone and of course up into non-tidal areas is purple loosestrife. Uh, a lot of insect grazing on this particular clump or clumps of purple loosestrife. This is uh, this is a rare deformation that occurs in purple loosestrife and a lot of other plants. It's called fasciation, 
we don't know if purple loose stripe whether it's caused by a mutation or an insect. This was a uh, root crown of purple loose stripe that broke loose and moved with the water or the ice and got set down upside down and is now sprouting around the uh, edge of the, what used to be the bottom of the root crown. So that's one of many ways that this plant and some other marsh plants are able to move from one place to another. So they actually do move under certain circumstances. Down in the brackish marshes, so this is, the brackish is somewhat salty, but not as salty as seawater. And in the Hudson, this, this ranges from just a little tiny bit of salt to um, up to about half seawater strength at Piermont Marsh at this time of the year. Some of the other plants that occur are swamp rose mallow, which is this flower that's like this. It's a beautiful wild relative of hollyhock. And, uh, and this is Tragomites, which does very well in brackish marshes. And, and one of the things that Tragomites is doing here is anchoring and building the sediment. So this actually is eroding. But if the Tragomites weren't there, it would be eroding much faster. This is in the spark of the creek at Piermont Marsh. Uh, and this is a little plant called um, Liliopsis that grows in the edge of the Fredmine. So it's actually a rare plant in the north. Uh, this is another brackish marsh, uh, large view of the marsh down at Haverstraw, which is one of the most urbanized or industrialized areas on the shore of the Hudson, north of New York City. And like our marshes up here, a lot of this is dominated by Phragmites or in, in some areas cat tails. And in spite of the marshes at Haverstraw and at Hudson, which is very industrialized, being greatly affected by urban and industrial development. Historically, there is a lot of life and a lot of different kinds of plants and animals in those marshes. This is one of the plants, not, not necessarily a desirable one, Japanese knotweed, that is one of the most, sorry, uh, I don't know my own strength here. Okay, uh, one of the, plants that grows along the Hudson that's the most tolerant of human activities and urban and industrial land use. And uh, you might wonder why the leaves are uh, gray down here instead of green. Well, that's where the high tides reached during the last day or two or maybe since the last heavy rain. So you can you can go out and look at the plants in one of these tidal marshes and you can see the silt that was deposited by a recent high tide. And it gives you an idea of where, this isn't exactly mean high water, but it gives you an idea of roughly where mean high water is. And, and now these are two things that grow in the freshwater tidal marshes uh, at the upper edge of the intertidal zone, right about mean high water, cardinal flower and seas weed. Cardinal flower also grows in non-tidal marshes. Seas weed not very often. It seems to be mainly along the Hudson. And in this uh, upper edge of the intertidal zone, a little of the intertidal zone, a little of the supratidal zone, we have tidal swamps that are dominated by shrubs or trees. Uh, this is in between Kruger Island and the mainland. Here's marsh that's dominated by non-woody plants and swamp that's dominated by woody plants, trees or shrubs or both. And here's another tidal swamp in North Bay near here uh, with a tree dominated area and a shrub dominated area. And this is up on back here. And this is another tidal swamp up it, uh, at uh, Mill Creek in, uh, it's right near the border between Columbia County and Rensselaer County. It's a nature conservancy preserve. It has a lovely boardwalk. 
going out into the tidal swamp along Mill Creek. And this is a great place to go on a hot day and see uh, the tidal swamp close up. And most of this is supratidal near the boardwalk, and then as you go, or if you could go to the north, it drops down into uh, upper intertidal zone, still tree and shrub dominated. This is another habitat called a supratidal pool. This one is up in the city of Hudson, but there are some of these on Kruger Island and in other places. This is a pool that fills with water during exceptionally high tides and holds that water most of the time. And along the Hudson, one of the interesting things that we find in these pools is, uh, is the northern leopard frog. My cat toy pointer isn't working so well. Um, in this part of the Hudson Valley, the northern leopard frog is closely associated with breeding habitat, egg laying habitat in supratidal pools. As you go farther north, it also occupies non-tidal areas. And you'll notice that this pool is bordered by Phragmites. Uh, there, uh, I'll say more about this in a minute, but there are Phragmites dominated habitats of certain types that are actually very good for many kinds of plants and animals, despite what people say about how horrible Phragmites is. Here's another habitat. It's in the mouth of a stream that flows from the uplands from the watershed into the estuary. And see how muddy this water is up to about here. Of course, I could tell you anything because you can't see the water farther up. But uh, take my word that, it, that the tides go up to about here. This is what we call the head of tide. So this is muddy from the tidal waters, and it's usually clearer up here. And these tidal stream mouths are very biologically rich. They have lots of different kinds of fish and birds and uh, invertebrates using them, much like the Indian kill mouth, which we were talking about earlier. And there's a different habitat still along the railroad. This is all fill that was placed in the shallows and the marshes 150 years ago. The East Shore Railroad was built in about 1850. A little bit later, uh, 25 years later, the West Shore Railroad was built. Uh, so big blocks of rock, uh, a lot of small crushed stone, a lot of coal clinkers and other stuff. And Surprisingly, it's very polluted with stuff from the diesel fuel and the coal fuel, but there are lots of plants that grow along here. Turtles nest, not terrifically good for the eggs. Uh, and uh, even something like eastern red cedar, which is you know, not a particularly urban tolerant or, or pollution tolerant tree. Somehow it's stunted here, probably because of herbicide use, but it does grow right up to the almost to the tracks. And this is one of the uh, big, deep, relatively stable pools that's kept open by the scouring action of the water rushing in and out under this bridge in uh, the railroad right here at North Bay. The main river is out here on the other side of the bridge, and the marshes back here. And then you can also, I'm not going to say much about it, but you can go onto the uplands and find another set of habitats that are not affected by the tides, although there are some things in the river that blow up into those habitats, or the animals move up there. Uh, but this is at Montgomery Place, it's the South Woods. Uh, it's very unusual in the Hudson Valley. This is the best developed lowland old growth forest in our entire region with many trees that are two, even three feet in diameter. Uh, oaks, hemlocks, sugar maple primarily. And one of the more curious things is this umbrella magnolia that 
probably escaped from plantings at Montgomery Place many years ago or planting somewhere else. And it's not taking over, but it is reproducing, and there's a, a population of it in the South Woods. And I think you have to go to Philadelphia to find another uh, established non-native population of this southern species. Why it does well here, we don't know. Intriguing. Now I want to just quickly say a few things about Phragmites because I try to level the playing field here because you'll hear and read a lot of horrible things about Phragmites and, and uh, in fact it's a plant uh, that has good and bad aspects. The good and bad are human judgments, you know, there's no such thing as good or bad in nature. Those are uh, those come from our, our values um, in, in our personal experiences. But this is a non-native plant, the kind of Phragmites in the Hudson Valley is non-native. It's the kind that's found throughout the old world. Um, there is native Phragmites, but we don't have any of it in the Hudson Valley as far as anyone's discovered yet. So this is a non-native plant like hundreds of other non-native plants, chicory along the side of the road, dandelion in the lawn, um, the corn that we eat in, in our corn fields. This happens to be one that's very weedy that does spread, that uh, can come to dominate large areas of the upper intertidal zone in the, in the tidal wetlands even way down into brackish water at Piermont, near Nyack. But it provides a lot of what ecologists call ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are the um, free work of nature that humans need in order to survive and in order to have quality of life. So our air, water, and soil are conditioned by the ecosystem services that nature provides, including Phragmites in some cases, and the habitats of that this thing called biodiversity, all of the uh, species and their genetic variants and the communities that they comprise uh, live in. Uh, so biodiversity support is an ecosystem service. Now, if you look at Phragmites from an ecosystem service point of view, it, it does some very important things. And, you know, it, we're not going to be alive when people really get overwhelmed by this. But if you can come back in 50 years or 100 years, you would probably find that the marshes that are dominated by Phragmites are going to resist sea level rise better than the ones that are covered by cattails even, which is pretty good at anchoring the soil, or some of the smaller plants. So that's one thing that Phragmites does that we're going to value a lot in the near future, and even now. Phragmites also causes problems. It can uh, degrade the habitat of certain kinds of plants and animals that we value. So it needs to be managed. And this is my opinion, not everyone agrees with me, but uh, I don't think spraying large amounts of herbicide on Phragmites or any other invasive weed is um, an appropriate way to manage nature. And, sorry, I really should leave this on the table. <laughs> um, there are other ways of managing Phragmites and, and other kinds of abundant weeds that are not toxic to other organisms and allow us to have the diversity of habitat that supports the diversity of species that we value. But Phragmites actually does support a lot of native species. I showed you a marsh wren, and this is a common grackle nest. Those are two very typical wetland birds. The marsh wren is a, a, a bird that's only found in extensive marshes. 
whether they're dominated by Trigonies or cattail or uh, tall cord grass. These are tree swallows trying to roost in um, a stand of Phragmites that was sprayed with herbicide the year before out here in North Bay. And, and the point that I want to make here is that uh, we've, we've studied three of these small patches of Phragmites, about an acre each, uh, for two years. And if we just looked at birds singing in June, which is a good indication of their breeding behavior, not very much breeding activity of songbirds in the Phragmites compared to an equal area of cattail, like a donut around the Phragmites. Okay, so an acre of cattail, an acre of Phragmites. But if we look at the roosting activity of birds, and I'm sorry, this graph is turned the other way. This is the hour before sunset. This is the next hour, the penultimate hour. Uh, of the day. And if you look here at cattail and phragmites, about the same amount of bird activity overall. This isn't just singing, this is all bird activity. If you look in the hour before it gets too dark to identify birds, so the last hour of the day, here's the phragmites. Um, lots, uh, large numbers of birds, such as this, um, in the phragmites. Not very many in the cattail. Uh, also, more species in the Phragmites than, than in the cattail. These are a dozen species of swallows, blackbirds, and a few other things like eastern kingbirds, all through the uh, spring, summer, and fall, even during the breeding season. So, these small patches of Phragmites out in the middle of the marsh are very good roosting habitat for songbirds. And it turns out this is true all over the world, wherever people have studied birds and, and phragmites. That's rather interesting. And clearly, there's something good about roosting in phragmites. There's something beneficial, safer, or warmer, or uh, something else that promotes the fitness of, uh, of individual birds. Uh, here's uh, a, a rebad of standard phragmites in the first year after herbicide treatment. And this is interesting because then a lot of small plants are coming up, but also the Phragmites is re-sprouting to some extent. And if you could keep the Phragmites out of an area like this, as the DEC has done in North Bay, more or less, um, uh, eventually it will fill in with cattails. So you'll have another tall, dense, but not quite as tall and dense as the Phragmites, and another upper intertidal zone plant. But there's a period of a few years when there's a lot of sparse, low <coughs> plants, and that's a very different kind of habitat. And it attracts a lot of insects and birds and different kinds of plants. Here's a, a rock rubble shore. Now, I don't know how much of this is construction and demolition debris. I think it's mostly naturally broken chunks of sandstone. And you can see this isn't a very easy place for plants to grow. So there are not very many species, and there, there's not a lot of dense vegetation cover. So that's a different kind of habitat. Uh, I'm just going to show you a few more slides, because we want to have a few minutes for, for questions. Um, this is interesting. I'm going to look at this again on Monday um, with someone who's interested in um, in managing non-native plants. There's a principle in managing non-native weeds out of the environment, which is when something first appears, that's the time you want to kill it and get rid of it. Because we don't know if it's going to become a serious pest or not. And there are uh, plants that have arrived here, either with our help or on their own from other places, that have become very serious problems. Uh, either for biodiversity or for agriculture or, or public health or something else. Uh, although most non-native weeds are not serious problems, we don't know ahead of time. So uh, this is um, variable flat sedge. These plants are about this big. They're growing in the middle of the tribal zone here off at Middle Ground Island in, uh, off uh, Hudson, north of here, 50, 15 miles north of here. Uh, this is a, a non-native plant. 
This is the first place where this was documented in the Hudson River. It's now known from two places, Stockport and Hudson, about four miles apart. Um, this is actually a rare native plant called uh, red root flap sedge. So a rare native and a so far a rare non-native growing mixed together in about an area that's probably about twice the size of this room. Uh, what should we do? Well, the prudent thing to do, because this is reported to be a pest in the southern states, it's, it's from the old world, um, I'm, I'm going to say, um, you know, we've given a lot of these plants names like Japanese knotweed and, you know, and animals in Norway rat and so forth. You know, they're awful, they come from another country and we don't, we don't like it. I, it would be nice if we could give them names that didn't have anything to do with their country of origin. The Japanese knotweed, first of all, doesn't just come from Japan. It's also found in Korea and China. So, so that's a misnomer, but it's also a, a prejudice that I dislike. So I'm just going to say this is from the old world. I'm not going to tell you what countries it's native to. Um, and, and this is native in the eastern United States. And the question is, what do we do? Well, we really should go out and eradicate this variable flat sedge while it's just in a very small area. We could do it cheaply without hurting anything else. Because we don't know if this, you know, if this is one plant out of a thousand that's going to become a serious environmental weed in the marshes. And by the time it gets to be that, if it does, it, it's like Phragmites or purple loosestrife or water chestnut. We can't do anything about it without causing an immense amount of damage to everything else. So no matter what anyone tells you, once something's been here for 100 or 200 years and it's all over, you can't do anything about it without causing a lot of damage. So that's one of, the, one of my take-home messages. This was an attempt to control water chestnut back, this photo was taken back in the early 1970s, but there was a period of about 12 years when the DEC tried to control water chestnut with herbicide. Uh, this is at Vanderburg Cove, and they were using, they hired a contractor with an airboat uh, to spray the water chestnut. And uh, I don't know whether this is true or not, but it's interesting that uh, between the 1930s, when a lot of early botany work was done with Hudson, and the 1970s, after a dozen years of attempting to kill water chestnut with a very toxic herbicide, 2,4-D, uh, uh, a dozen or 20 species of very rare plants disappeared completely from the Hudson, or almost completely. And some of those have never been found again. Some of them have reappeared. Um, so, uh, this has been done in a lot of the marshes, a lot of the freshwater tidal marshes up and down the river, and eventually it was discovered that the state didn't have a federal permit to spray herbicide in the estuary, and they, they stopped and the water chestnut came back. And now we know that there's too much of it to try to control, so the question is, what do you do? Well, I think what we do is we take patches of it out to open up the habitat, to let more oxygen, dissolved oxygen into the water because uh, that's one of the problems that water chestnut causes. It uses up the oxygen uh, underneath it. And, um, and then use that biomass for something. Generate methane, it's very good for that. There are other things that could be used for, like compost. Okay, so um, I'm going to end with this slide because I think the snapping turtle, partly I like them because I studied them for, for four years, about 40 years ago in, in North Bay. Um, uh, partly it's, it's an iconic species. It's very, it's not restricted to the Hudson by any means, but it is very abundant in the Hudson River marshes and it's the only reptile that really does well there. And if you go out at the right time in uh, about the second week of June, uh, during or after a warm, a heavy warm rain, 
you can see dozens, maybe even a hundred of these coming up to lay their eggs, as this one is doing on the railroad at North Bay or down at uh, Boscobel on the bluff overlooking Constitution Marsh. They actually have a, a party there every year to celebrate the nesting of the snapping turtles, which I think is wonderful. Because lots of people hate snapping turtles, even though it's a good native organism that, that uh, um, helped a lot of people survive uh, by feeding them for many years. Um, so, I could, you know, say lots more, but I'm curious if you have some questions or or uh, comments, observations that you'd like to contribute, and maybe you're interested in hearing a little bit more about something that I said, or if you want me to steer you to something that you could read or, or look up uh, for more information. Yes? You had mentioned about some islands, they, they're still an island even though submerged. Does an island, can it be all rock, or does it have to have vegetation? Uh, well, island, the, the way that most people use the term, it, it doesn't have anything to do with whether there are plants there or not. So, Skillpot Island, which is about the size of this building, a little smaller, in, in South Bay, is <coughs> mostly rock. It has a few plants growing on it and some lichens, which are, are fungi, essentially. Uh, but n not continuous cover of vegetation. So but we still call it an island. And it's interesting because at low tide it isn't an island. The mudflats connected to the to Montgomery Place, to the mainland at low tide. So there are two things there that seem uh, contradictory. Eric, what do the people in, in New York City buy the water chestnuts for? Do they use them for do they just paint them or do they uh, plant I don't, them or? I don't know. You know, you look on the web and you'll see them for sale. And, I'm, and the market seems to be in New York City, although maybe there are people here that I mean, would be silly for us to buy water chestnuts. It's like taking coals to Newcastle. Right? Maybe, um, maybe um, I, I think it's a curiosity. It doesn't grow in New York City yet. Uh, it, there are certainly freshwater ponds where water chestnut could grow. I haven't heard of any of it in the city. And the river is too brackish down there for water chestnut. It only grows in the river down to the, uh, just south of the Bear Mountain Bridge in just a little tiny bit in, at Iona Island Marsh. So I think people see it as something curious and weird and, uh, you know, there's some people call them devil nuts and they make fetishes out of them and some people make jewelry out of them. I see necklaces. It sounds a little masochistic. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so that's, you know, that's all I know about it. But I think the, I think uh, painting faces on them is marvelous. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how she does it, but my dog eats them. She loves going down by the river. Wow. Uh, my question was that um, I was sitting down on the dock the other day, about a week ago, and I noticed coming along the shore. It was coming. The tide was coming in, and along the shore were these big flotillas. Uh, as far as you could see, north and south, along, floating along the shore, of uh, these tiny groups of tiny little green, almost cell-looking like things. Yeah. What is that? Well, they're duckweeds, yeah. probably. I mean, I, I'm not sure without seeing them, but that's that's About very, very likely. About sixteenth of an inch. Or yeah, two there are uh, three or four kinds in the Hudson, <coughs> and and you know they're places like ponds around here. And they, um, they're they little free-floating plants. They're not attached to anything. Uh, the, uh, some of them have roots. Two kinds have roots. The, the red duckweed, which is sort of an oxymoron because it's only this big. Mm -hmm. And uh, common duckweed both have roots. And then there are the little, really tiny pinhead-sized ones that are called water meal that don't even have roots. And these are actually flowering plants, although they don't, they don't usually flower. They usually just um, bud off and, you know, and, and make a, a, a daughter plant that, that separates from the parent and, and goes off on its own. That's how they reproduce. 
Uh, but what happens, so you saw that at this time of the year? Yeah. So what happens in South Bay, for example, in, in some of the other marshes, where there's a lot of water chestnut, in the summer, from, from, about, mid, from about late June until the end of September, roughly, uh, things are pretty covered by water chestnut. And in between the water chestnut leaves, so there's little bits of water, it's a really great, quiet, nutrient-rich place for ducklings. And there's nothing to shade them. They need sun, you know, they need nutrients, they need uh, water that's about neutral and pH, just like the water chestnut. And, uh, and so they reproduce there and fill up all those little spaces. So there are lots and lots and lots of these little tiny duckweed plants. And then when the water chestnut decomposes from, you know, through September and, and, and up till now, it's just rotting and breaking up into little tiny pieces. All those duckweeds are liberated and the tide carries them out into the river and back into another marsh somewhere, and, you know. Uh, so, and some of that happens during the summer. There's always some of that floating around the, in the river. So that's probably what you saw. It almost looked like a stream into itself, yeah. like, as far as you could see. Yeah, right. And, and, and there are lots of animals that like to eat those. Turtles eat them, ducks eat them, which is why it's called duckweed. Uh, people used to feed them to pigs. You have to gather a lot of duckweed to feed them to pigs. But, but sometimes there's a pond which is very, very solidly covered with duckweed, and you can actually collect it and feed it to something. And here's some little plant. Okay, one question in the back. Yeah, um, you showed uh, one non-native plant, I think it was uh, Cypress diphonus um, earlier. Is there is that strictly a tidal plant? And if so, is there other lookalikes? That's a variable flat sedge that I mentioned. Yeah. It had just been discovered in the Hudson a few years ago. Uh, I don't think so. Um, I think in the southern United States it grows in non-tidal waters. There isn't a lot of information that's readily available. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the northernmost known location for it in North America, uh, on the Hudson at Hudson and, and Stockholm. Okay. And, it's, and we found it in 2007, I think, and then a year or two later, a uh, botanist from the New York Botanical Garden found it uh, in a different location. So right now, as far as we know, there's just these two little patches. And I, I, I don't think, and I think it's from Southeast Asia, I don't think it's limited to estuaries there. I think it's just a, a freshwater plant that grows in different kinds of wildlife. Yeah. Okay, thank you.